Thank you, Sherrick. I really appreciate that. Uh, introductions are not my thing. I always get uh, uncomfortable when people are introducing me, but I appreciate you so much and, and meeting as well. Uh, it was like that. We really, can you hear okay? Are you? Yeah, but then I'm hard of hearing. Okay, can you, can you hear me okay, everybody? Good, good. So uh, yeah, it was really great to have the pleasure to meet Sherrick. We're always looking for new tools and, and I'll explain a little bit about what we do, uh, but always looking for new, new tools in the clinic and, and I am my, father's son, I'm a tire kicker extraordinaire, so we don't jump into things easily, particularly with the work that we're in. You know, somebody's approaching us pretty much every week with a new, uh, as technology increases as well, a new app, a new device, a new something to help the brain or nervous system work better. So, you know, we have to tread very lightly because if not, we wouldn't be treating patients, we'd be testing out devices all day. Uh, but I saw someone using a Resimax online somewhere, I can't recall how, but I saw it, I ordered it, and we started using it, and uh, yeah, I remember reaching out to Sherrick. I don't know if I, I started critiquing you right off the bat. I think we uh, had, had uh, become friends at first, but uh, you know, really just saw applications far beyond where it was going because it was primarily pain in, in the beginning, right? And uh, we, I started out in the physical medicine, uh, physical medicine and rehab worlds 22, 23 years ago, so I was working a lot with back pain, neck pain, headaches, all that. Um, I don't do any of that anymore. Uh, we'll talk about the, you know, the, the few areas that I work with, but traumatic brain injury, acquired brain injury is one of the biggest areas of focus for us. And this tool was a game changer. In addition to all the things we have in our, our clinic, it was an absolute game changer, uh, game changer and I'll tell you why. So uh, my name is uh, Michael Trayford, board certified chiropractic neurologist. A lot of people say, what is that? Uh, just like in medicine or other disciplines, you have specialties. And these are postgraduate specialties that take several years to attain board certifications. You have to maintain these board certifications. And um, you know, it just kind of puts you on a different level within your profession. And the good thing is uh, there are many states that recognize as a separate discipline, North Carolina, where I'm at. Uh, even insurance entities uh, like workers' compensation will look at uh, doctors of chiropractic with ne neurology degrees on separate fee schedules so they understand that, you know, we know a little something about the nervous system studying it for so long. Um, and I've been study, studying it since 1998 and, and have not looked back. So I'm also board, board certified in neurofeedback. I introduced neurofeedback and biofeedback into my practice about 10 years ago. Uh, we do a lot of, as Sherrick was talking about, and, and I'll kind of touch on some things that we just started with that won't, we won't really be able to share today because it's in the infancy, but we're doing some uh, look at uh, EEG and S. Loretta imaging, if anybody's familiar with that on the uh, impacts of the Resimax pain tuner on things like the default mode network in the brain and some other areas. So I'll touch on that as well. Uh, as well, too, I was just talking with this gentleman over here. I, I have a lot of crossover. I'm not a mental health provider, but I work very closely with many in the mental health arena because you know the neurosciences and mental health need to come together, but they rarely do. So it's been a uh, kind of a mission of mine over the past 15 years or so to start to bridge that gap. Uh, you know, the, the, the mental health providers that truly understand the underpinnings of traumatic brain injury, concussion, even psychological trauma, et cetera, they realize, you know, when we do the work we can do, their jobs become a lot easier. You know, they can get to places sooner with their individuals with addictive and compulsive behaviors, post-traumatic stress, you name it. Uh, and it's all about regulation, right? It's all about regulation, and this kind of circles back to why we're here, and that's the Resimax pain tuner and it's one of the best self-regulation tools on the planet, bar none. That's primarily what I use it for. So we'll talk more about that as we go. Um, I put up here a couple of boards I sit on, uh, not to say I sit on these boards, but to show the crossover and the acceptance of, of new ideas and understanding of things that need to be talked about. Uh, Dementia Society of America, I sit on the board of advisors there, they saw what we were doing, uh, in addition to provi uh, providing funding for research for music therapy, art therapy, et cetera, for those with cognitive impairment in the here and now versus the search for the elusive cure, uh, that's what's happening. There is a, a tide shift about. And then the uh, International Society of uh, Neuroregulation and Research, it's the main governing body in the, uh, the neurofeedback and biofeedback world. So I was really happy to join them about six months ago. And uh, you know, I'm kind of the, the oddball on the board because mostly it's PhD psychologists uh, but again, there's, there's something happening, different disciplines getting together to talk about the critical issues. 
And uh, there are some critical issues, especially the last couple of years in this wave of trauma. Uh, you know, Dr. Jones is talking about before, what is, you know, what's with this? Everybody has anxiety, PTSD. Everybody's brains are ramped up and it's even more prevalent now with these last uh, almost three years of, of things that have been happening with the, uh, the pandemic. So a bit of history. Um, so I stumbled across Resimax, I told you about 2018 reached out to Sharrick and um, immediately became a potent tool in our rehab arsenal. And then uh, had Sharrick come out and speak at our international organization, IAFNR, uh, it's for functional neurology and rehabilitation. He presented there 2019 and came out and visited and the rest is history. And I just wanna thank Sharrick because, you know, this is the culmination of an incredible amount of hard work, uh, financial sacrifice, family sacrifice, I'm sure. Uh, a lot of that goes on, you know, inventions don't happen easily. And uh, this guy can write a book on, on, on how to invent something and make it get to a place where it's, it's helping the masses. I just love seeing this, all these people in this room and all the people virtually, uh, tremendous, tremendous job. Kudos to you. <laughs> and here was Sherrick uh, at our facility in North Carolina. And uh, on the left here, this is with a family from South Carolina, unfortunate uh, young man hit by a drunk driver and uh, massive diffuse axonal brain injury. And uh, Sharrick really had come in and showed them some pretty incredible techniques that they use to this day to help with things like you know muscle tone issues, self-regulation, et cetera. When somebody's had a severe traumatic brain injury, they go through various stages of healing, right? And uh, most of them will never be the same again. But our goal is to increase the level of humanism as much as we can. If it's somebody moving a hand that they couldn't move or you know, bringing a fork to the mouth when they can actually feed again free of a peg tube or you know, not storming or, or seizing because their nervous system just can't figure out how to reconnect. And that's where a device like the, uh, the Tuner Pro comes in and they really learned quite a bit, particularly for muscle spasticity. This particular individual, and I do have permission from all of these folks that you'll be seeing to talk about their cases, uh, some of his muscle spasticity was so great that it was actually pulling uh, joints and limbs out of alignment. So, and significant alignment, very, very painful, and painful for a person that can't communicate that pain. So, uh, the Resimax was absolutely huge there. So about us, uh, we were formed in 2013. I've been at this for 22, 23 years. Uh, we formed Apex as a neuroimmersive rehabilitation program. We were one of the first in the functional neurology world doing this type of work immersively, meaning people come to us for a week or two or three or sometimes four, and we're working hour after hour, day after day, physical, cognitive, metabolic, neurological rehabilitation. Uh, we see folks from all over. I'll show you a case. We actually have a case in from France this week. Uh, we've been working with them for a year and a half and COVID finally, uh, the restrictions have finally lifted over there and they were able to get over to, uh, to uh, North Carolina, which they actually call the Paris of the South. So they kind of feel a little bit at home. So uh, we serve uh, lots of patients from around and our primary areas of focus are traumatic and acquired brain injuries. So from your concussion and post-concussion syndrome all the way to near fatal drowning, strangulations, electrocutions, um, heart attack with subsequent anoxic brain injury, things like that. Uh, these are you know, things that keep you up in ways you don't wanna be kept up at night, especially if you have two young girls like I do. So uh, you know, we do our best to make our difference in the world and just hope, you know, hope and pray that um, you know, these things never happen close to home. So adulthood learning and behavioral issues with an emphasis on addictive and compulsive behaviors. I'm actually writing a book on brain-based addiction recovery right now and a huge area of focus for us. Cognitive impairment, neurodegenerative diseases, Parkinson's, ALS, MS, and uh, peak performance. That's really all we see these days. So what we're doing at the end of the day too, I put this at the end here just today. So really we're physically based cognitive and beha behavioral therapy. When you look at you know, brain body connection, as esoteric as that sounds for many, that's what it's all about. When somebody's more rooted in their physical body, they're going to think better and react better and inhibit impulses more effectively and regulate emotional output more effectively. That's what we're doing all day, every day, whether it's balance and vestibular rehabilitation, eye movement therapies, complex motor skills, motor timing mechanisms. Clearly we do a lot of other things on top of that, but that's where we yield the greatest benefit cognitively for people is with the physical rehabilitation. So um, we broad, spec broad spectrum neurological, physical, 
uh, rehab cognitive as well. The Resimax is a huge part of that. Neurofeedback, biofeedback, hyperbaric, you can kind of see all that up there. We use a lot of different therapies because we need a broad toolbox for what we see. You know, they always say if you, you know, if, if, you, uh, have a, if you only have a hammer, all you're going to see is nails, right? We need to have different tools available because each person responds differently. Uh, we do a lot of distance counseling as well. Let me go ahead here. So we're going to talk about, uh, I'm going to bring up a bunch of videos. So I think, you know, seeing is learning. If you can see what we're doing for these folks, you can, if you happen to treat folks in this arena, uh, it will be beneficial. If not, it will still be beneficial. But what we're going to do is uh, talk about what we love to do. And, and at the end of the day, our number one approach to people that we see is self-regulation. We need to get their nervous systems under control. Because the fact is, when you, when you remove access to the frontal brain because you're in chronic fight flight, you can't get much done from a rehabilitation standpoint. So we have to calm down that nervous system. So self-regulation, our ability to control basically output, physical, emotional, cognitive, behavioral. One of the greatest challenges we face, we kind of touched on that, nearly everyone is stuck in fight flight. There are very few, which we see as well, that are stuck in high parasympathetic drive, which is actually quite dangerous and sometimes more dangerous than the, the chronic fight flight. Uh, and we have techniques with the Resimex that we're using to help people get heart rates that are stuck down at 30, 35, 40 beats per minute. Uh, and not variable at all and actually getting them to more healthy numbers because uh, you don't want a heart rate at 35 beats per minute. So self-regulation uh, is, this is interesting too. So when we're helping people self-regulate, we're helping their cognitive functions, period. Uh, simple attention and selective attention has been likened to uh, self-regulation. It's the same part of the brain, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So when we can help somebody regulate emotional output, uh, you know, through, you know, working out of, of reaction time, impulse control, different types of exercises, we help them connect better to their frontal thinking human brain. So what we're going to do is uh, look at, uh, let me, oh, it's just touching on this. We are collecting preliminary data. Now our services are multifactorial, so it's really hard to kind of peel one type of therapy out and, you know, say that this equals this. But with Resimax in concert with what we've been doing over the years, we now are demonstrating 30% gains in simple attention on standardized cognitive testing in five-day programs. So we're talking about 15 hours of contact with somebody over the course of five days, which we can get a lot done. But 30% gains in Resimax is a huge, huge part of that. We are currently performing the, uh, the studies I, I talked about, and I want to show that to you because there are some really cool things happening in the electro-diagnostic world. So this is uh, S. Loretta imaging. It's low resonance uh, or low resolution tomography. It's basically three-dimensional re reconstruction of electrical data from the brain. And we can look at pretty much any part of the brain. It used to be EEG is, is cortical, is surface brain activity or output, electrical output. What happens now with the um, advances in software uh, systems that can basically compute this electrical data, now we can start looking subcortically. So this right here is a brain. This is the front part of the brain. This is the back part of the brain. It's just rotating around so you can see the different parts. But what we're visualizing here is something called the default mode network. Are people familiar with that? So if not, start reading up on it because default mode network is at the root of so much we're seeing right now with addiction. Uh, obsessive compulsive behaviors, PTSD, etc. So uh, the default mode network is really the only part of the brain that is active or parts of the brain connected that are active when we're not directing our attention outward. So we have two types of attention. It, well, we have inwardly directed attention, we have outwardly directed attention. And brain waves play into that. Delta and theta brain waves are when we're paying more attention to what's happening inside the body, like when we're sleeping. Uh, beta and gamma activities are when we're outwardly directed. So when we're doing any kind of task or having a conversation with somebody. So the cool thing is we can image all of these different brain waves separately, uh, but we are now putting together some things with this uh, S. Loretta imaging and the Resimax, seeing what kind of impact it has on this default mode network. When you're meditating, you're exercising, if you're mindfully meditating, not concentration-based meditation, but if you're mindfully meditating, you're exercising the default mode network. You're more internally focused at that point. And, and 
you know, book after book, study after study is showing that it's clearly important for people to disengage from their external environment if they're ever to get past things that are plaguing us right now, like the addictions, uh, post-traumatic stress, etc. cetera. Uh, if anybody's any, read any work by John Kabat-Zinn and others, uh, you know, mindfulness is a huge deal. And here's the conundrum. And we always say the people that need it the most find it the hardest to do. So we can't just tell somebody to sit in a chair, close their eyes, focus on their breath, because you know, their monkey mind is, is going absolutely nuts and they can't do it. So enter Resimax, enter gargling. I know uh, Sherrick talked about that before. You know, gargling is a powerful parasympathetic stimulant. And here's the deal, you know, I think Dr. Jones was talking about the seesaw, there's this constant flux. You know, you have fight, flight, you have rest and digest, and they're always kind of battling one another, but in most people, fight, flight is winning. So the more you can stimulate rest, digest, the more you can squash, fight, flight. And we can do that through things that will stimulate the vagus nerve. Gargling is one of the most powerful. It's just a, a lighter version of vomiting, and we're not going to vomit, but think about it. We work with a lot of people in the eating disordered realm, and what happens when people do purge, there's um, authors that suggest they're doing it for that parasympathetic activation because they're chronically stuck in fight flight. So after you vomit, you feel like a million bucks. You know, you feel relaxed, you feel uh, just this kind of peace and calm come over you. That's the parasympathetic response that has driven that sympathetic response all the way down. We can mimic that through gargling, doing it as an exercise. We can mimic it with the, uh, the Resimax tuner. So there's a lot of different ways we can go in, different breathing exercises, neurofeedback. But we love the tuner because if somebody you know, isn't going to do breathing exercises or they can't sit quietly and mindfully meditate or whatever the case may be, now they have something they can physically just put on their body, do some humming, next thing you know they're more relaxed, their brain is more accessible. So I'm going to pull out of here. I have this little info. Uh, how do you say it? I still don't know. Is it GIF? Is it GIF? Is it GIF? Um, but that, that thing right there, I, I had this made. Uh, a lot of it was based on Viktor Frankl's work, Man's Search for Meaning, if anybody read that. Uh, it talks about the space between stimulus and response. As humans, we should have a space between stimulus and response because we have more advanced brains. You know, you poke the dog, you get bit because they don't have a lot of space between stimulus and response. So when people are chronically in fight, flight, agitated, hypervigilant, et cetera, you know, they're at this, you know, they're at this stage of things where it's, you know, they're compressed in the middle, very little space between stimulus and response. They're the dog where you poke them and you get bit. So the Resimax, breathing exercises, whatever it is, helps us to increase that space between stimulus and response. And what happens at that point, we have more access to our uh, decision-making, reasoning, impulse control, all the things that make us uniquely human. So I think I've talked enough about the self-regulation component. I want to show you a couple of videos. So um, self-regulation. If anybody knows this guy, so uh, Matt Hughes, uh, professional, uh, was a professional UFC MMA fighter, uh, UFC uh, Hall of Fame. He had a horrific, uh, in addition to the years of beating that his brain took from fighting, uh, he had a horrific accident in uh, Illinois where his car was going over train track and he got hit by the train. And uh, massive, massive, massive brain injury. He's a very lucky man to be walking and talking and doing all the things he's doing. Uh, but we were working with him and self-regulation was a big component of that. And I, Sherrick, I know, will love this picture. And he assured me he was not driving when he was using the Resimax. But he takes this thing everywhere he goes because he knows the power of being able to change your physiology at a moment's notice. Because once we get caught up in things, it's really hard to kind of talk yourself down off the ledge, so to speak. But if you have a device that you can use to do that, and, and right here, my point with this is, this is one of our favorite techniques, is this. So this is Matt in the clinic, and you're gonna hear him humming nice and loud there. And we talk about, just like gargling loud and proud, we want people to hum nice and loud. So they've got the blue wings right there under the clavicles, they've got the base right at the bottom of the sternum, and they've just put a little bit of overpressure on it. They can lie down, they can be seated. We often couple therapies, so we will do you know, dual tasking, triple tasking, quadruple tasking, so we might be doing laser therapy while doing Resimax, or they might be you know, on whole body vibration plates while doing it. They might be doing neurofeedback while doing it. Uh, there, there's lots of different ways. But 
the bottom line is, uh, you know, this long, deep, and I, I have it kind of written out, I'll show you the slide in a minute, but uh, it's basically three hums in a row. Real deep, real loud, real steady and consistent. This is super important because uh, it's like any kind of practice. You know, you can throw that thing on your chest and you're going to get some benefit, but if you really um, focus the practice, that's when things are going to get a lot, a lot better. Kind of like meditation. You know, people don't get good at meditation in a week or a month or a year or five years. They keep working at it because it's always a work in progress. So these breathing exercises and things we do with the, uh, the Resi Max, the humming exercises, uh, that is constant practice. And the fact is we're seeing people that really engage in the, the nuances, in the level of the humming, in the length of it, in the steadiness and consistency of the humming. Uh, they just get better at it. They get better at it a lot faster. So, you know, that kind of perfect practice makes perfect. You can do it, get some benefit, but you can do it really well and get a lot more benefit. So this is our favorite one. The, um, you can read that there. I won't, don't have to put it back on the slideshow. So the basic unit, bottom of the, bottom of the sternum, start at level one. That's just a really good place, that 40, 50, 48, 50 hertz or so. And then we bring it up over time. We don't want it to be super high, but people tend to feel as we can get higher, number two, number three, uh, that they're getting more benefit from it. But you don't want to start out somebody who's hypervigilant in that, uh, those high numbers. Yeah. Uh, we had a suggestion uh, just a while ago. Why doesn't everybody take out their tuner if they've got it and actually practice along with this? Yeah, Feel yeah. What that feels like. It'll, Got to uh, break those tuners out. Better. Absolutely. We don't want anybody falling asleep on us here. It's just after lunch and the, uh, you know, the self-regulation techniques, we're going to need some pillows here. <laughs> All right. So you want to run through that real quick? All right. Everybody got their tuners ready to roll? All right. So just level one. The blue, little blue wheels under the sternum, just uh, under the clavicles. Make sure you lock them in and under those clavicles because bones transmit vibration very, very well. So if we get them on the bones, we're going to get much deeper uh, transmission of the frequency into the chest cavity, stimulating that vagus nerve, particularly when we're humming from the inside, creating that resonant frequency between the hum and the device itself. So you've got those locked under the clavicle there, the base of the unit at the bottom of the sternum on that xiphoid process there. And start at level one, what we're going to do is just three long, deep, loud, and steady hums. So you don't want the hum being, mm, 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 you know, just mm, real deep, steady, and long until you can't breathe anymore. And then you just breathe back in, hum again. Ah, oh, I got one. And I'll hum with you on that. I'll hum with you on that last one. Here's number three. Ready? Deep breath in. I've been practicing this for a while. I could go for about, a, about a 45 seconds on that one. So three of those, and obviously in the context, you know, practice this tonight. Three of those will bring your nervous system down. And then what you do is you take about a two minute break, you keep the, you keep the tuner on there going, and then you do three more in about two minutes. I like to call this high intensity interval training for the autonomic nervous system because you get a burst of activity and then you kind of jog a little bit and then a burst of activity and you jog a little bit. So this is, you know, a form of, we have a lot of high intensity interval type strategies for training of the nervous system, particularly the autonomic nervous system, but this is one of the best. Uh, again, perfect practice makes perfect, so make sure you, you know, put, put emphasis on it, think about it as you're doing it, you know, technique is everything. So I want to go ahead and show a few more videos here. So another way we use this, uh, we, we utilize hyperbaric oxygen therapy as one of our therapies. So right here, a lot of people, sorry, that's, uh, the compressors can be some, somewhat loud. So a lot of people are intimidated by hyperbaric oxygen therapy chambers. Even the word chamber, probably not the best choice of word for uh, you know, we, we call it the tube or whatever, you know, we, we rarely use the word chamber, but the fact is we're seeing people that have had strangulations, near fatal drownings, um, you know, people that have been buried alive, uh, you know, these are, are significantly uh, traumatic events that clearly would warrant phobias of enclosed tight spaces. Now, when this thing is, you know, these are big spaces in hyperbaric chambers if you've ever been in one, but just the thought of somebody going into something that's going to get sealed 
behind them, even though they have two-way radios and all that good stuff, uh, they can get somewhat uneasy. So we have Resimax tuners in every hyperbaric room, and we teach people how to use them right off the bat. They go in with these things. Next thing you know, 15 minutes later, we're looking in the window, and they're asleep. And this is somebody who didn't even want to go in there. We have rare exceptions, but for uh, the most part, Resimax has increased people's ability to get in the hyperbaric chambers effectively. So pretty cool. All right. So I want to show some applications here. Again, we see a lot of severe traumatic brain injury. I'm going to start with a concussion case. Um, concussions, interesting. So what happens is, you know, a lot of people think concussions, oh, a little bump to the head, no big deal. Uh, in some cases, concussions and post-concussion syndrome can be much worse than severe traumatic brain injury in some respects. Granted, severe traumatic brain injury, people can't move and do things like that. But for the most part, their autonomic nervous systems are fairly well regulated. So what happens with concussion, particularly with the whiplash component, we get brainstem traction injuries. Brainstem injuries in general are not good. And this is where people get into the heart rate issues and the digestive issues and you know, the, uh, the, the psychological and mental health issues with post-concussion syndrome that most people say that had nothing to do with that, but it's because of those brainstem traction injuries. Uh, here's a woman who had multiple concussions. She's just doing a simple test, finger to nose test, uh, we just want to see how her brain is getting information when she's not using her eyes. And this is a highly diagnostic test. And you're going to see right here, she's doing it with her right arm. So watch this. Watch as her right arm comes to her nose. What happens is you're going to see the arm coming in and it's just kind of breaking down all over the place and she gets her finger on her mouth basically. So this is, you're going to see this here. And we always repeat it so you're going to see her do it two times. So watch that finger come in. Doesn't really know where it's going. Kind of winds up right on the lips there. And then she, even after, didn't even really bring it up to the nose. So she's going to do it again. We just like to repeat it because sometimes the brain learns and it'll get it right there each time after. But in this case, uh, clearly she was having issues even with repeat testing. So what do we do now? We strap a Resimax tuner on the backside of her right arm. And this is immediately after. Watch this. Even the quality of movement. Look, it's not, you know, her arm isn't really shaking anymore now at this and boom, right to her nose. Pretty cool. You know, it's, it's one of the most diagnostic neurological bedside tests. And all we did was put a little bit of proprioceptive stimulation on the extensors on her forearm, and now she's getting there every time, like clockwork. All right, so we take it a step further and say, that's pretty cool. When she's got this thing on her arm, she can get her finger through her nose. Let's take it off and see what happens. And this was immediately after. So this is all in a sequence in about two minutes. And here she goes, much more confident in her approach, and now she's getting the finger to the nose. And um, she was in tears after this, basically, because she was so upset that she couldn't get her finger to her nose with her eyes closed. But this just tells us brain-body connections. Her body is now better connected to her brain and vice versa, which leads to so many things. Now, doing that one time, okay, that's good, you know, well and good, but at the end of the day, she, you know, we do these things hundreds of times thousands of times. Neuroplasticity. You know, you can make nerves connect one time, but you know, you have to keep making them connect and connect and connect. Frequency and intensity of care is so important. That's why we've reverted back to immersive rehab experiences because we can get more done in five days than we could in five or six months, you know, seeing somebody once a week or twice a week. I'm going to put this down. Okay, so that was a cool one here. Uh, this one, I like this one. This is uh, kind of a peak performance case. And uh, this fellow right here, if anybody saw the 2020, uh, 2012 London Olympics, the men's 4x4 relay, there was the, uh, the guy that broke his leg and they still won the silver medal. Um, he happens to live right in our neighborhood and uh, he came and we were doing some work because he was actually pushing to be on the bobsled team right now in Tokyo. And um, so what we're doing is we're working with him here on something called a neurosensory motor integrator. So what's that? That is basically a lot of hand-eye coordination drills and things like that. He's also standing on a balance platform down here, which is quantifying his balance so he can, and giving him feedback so he can stay in one place. So if you look here, if you look right here, there's a little thing in the center and you can see it's green. Hopefully you can see it's green. They have to keep their balance in that green area. And what's going to happen is you're going to see oranges pop up because he's having a bit of a hard time, even though he's a finely tuned uh, finely tuned athlete, he's having a hard time keeping in that center balance area. So if I just hit play here, 
you're going to see sometimes where it goes into the orange. So right there, it goes into the orange, right there it goes into the orange, and right there it goes into the orange. So he's having a real hard time for an athlete of his caliber keeping in that central balance place, uh, uh, you know, a stable center of pressure, we call it. So here we go, and all we did here was we strapped a couple of Resimax pain tuners to his leg, and we've got these things all over the clinic. I can't even tell you how many of these things we have at this point. <clears throat> so just watch now. So we've got these tuners to the back of his leg, increased proprioception through the calves, through the bones, you know, the medial and lateral malleoli on the sides of the knees. So he's getting input through muscles, getting in th input through bones and joints. And here now, not, o not only is his balance better, but his reaction time uh, improves significantly with these drills. You can even see the, the tempo, the cadence is gonna be a little bit faster here. But watch that center, it does not come out of the green anymore. He's just locked on that right now. So. Pretty darn cool for peak performance. There's lots we can do with these tools for peak performance training. And these are you know, people that have access to pretty much any resource they want as far as treatment training go. And um, you know, he absolutely loves these things. So we're gonna be in the, uh, you're, you're gonna be in the Olympics uh, next time around. Okay. So we have, um, and, and you know, we have a lot of the heartbreaking cases as well. So here is a fella uh, brainstem stroke, probably one of the worst injuries you could have because it, you know, there, there's that locked in syndrome, right? So brainstem strokes are, are really some of the worst. What we're doing here is we're basically just trying to get activation of his hand so he can use controls on the wheelchair uh, at some point. Really, that's what we're looking to do, just get to that point and hopefully beyond. But as we're stimulating the interossei muscles between the fingers, um, we see we start to get engagement of his hands. If you just look at his face, you can see when he starts straining to extend those fingers. So I'm basically, I'm telling him at this point to extend the fingers and he's having a hard time doing it. So he's just trying to link brain and body. And you're gonna see right here, when you start seeing him struggle a little bit, you're gonna see those fingers want to lift up there. We start scraping the backside of the forearm and now he will actually get some engagement of those finger extensors. So you can see he just lifts those fingers and he's actually smiling there, which is pretty darn cool. Because nice. he knows he just, he's holding those fingers up a little bit in extension. It doesn't seem like a lot. This stuff is very, very subtle. But when you go from zero engagement to now having 5%, we'll take it all day, every day. Because 5% will lead to 10%, will lead to 15 Who knows? We don't know where these cases are going to go. I always say, you know, I left my uh, crystal ball in the shop. And, and I say that lightheartedly because we can't predict. You know, we will never claim to do this or that. We take each one as they come, but over 20 plus years of doing this, I've been very surprised. There's been a lot of people that were not supposed to walk that are walking, that are, weren't supposed to talk that are talking. Some people you wouldn't even know had brain injuries at some point. You know, again, these are the most severe right here with the brainstem, but you know, there has to be some degree of hope. And that smile kind of says it all. So um, I want to show you, how am I doing on time? Good? Doing good? All right, so this is another one. This was a really um, heart-wrenching case. This guy is one of the funniest humans I've ever met, Sam. He would always come in just dressed in the craziest colors every day. Uh, bee sting, anaphylactic reaction, heart attack, anoxic brain injury. You know, it's these things that we just never know. But this is what happened to this particular individual. And what happens is, now we can use the Resimax very specifically. You'll see us just, you know, it seems like we're just scraping certain parts and sometimes we are doing more general type of stimulation. Uh, but in cases like this, we're being very specific. If you look, so these muscles on this side of the forearm move the pinky and the ring finger. These muscles on this side of the forearm move the thumb and the, and the, the pointer and the middle finger. So depending on where you stimulate, you're gonna activate different fingers when you're working in the forearm, okay? So the back side of the forearm here, uh, that's what controls extension of the fingers and people that have had these types of injuries usually they're flexed so we have to do a lot of work with extensor muscles engage activate extensor muscles to be able to get them to you know be able to manipulate their fingers and, and help with uh, gross and fine motor control so what happens here um, his fingers were kind of stuck in this claw type position and he just couldn't lift them up or separate them and what you're going to see here is as we start working this inside of the forearm here you're going to start to see some activity of those muscles. So let me go ahead and do that. 
And we're basically just turning these on level one or two or three, depending. Some people are super sensitive and it can really, you know, kind of throw them for a loop. But once I, there I'm working the outside a bit. And as I do, you'll see some engagement of that pinky. And then we come to the inside a little bit and I'm gonna ask him to start to move these fingers and you'll see he's going to begin to get some engagement. Again, these are very, very subtle findings, but absolutely huge for these individuals to hopefully you know, be able to hold a fork or a pencil or something at one point in time. So we're coming to the end here. Now I'm asking him to do that. It's not working so well. There we go, right there. Now you get the opening of that finger. So that was completely voluntary. You know, these folks can't do that by themselves. He's constantly locked in that claw. So just doing a little bit of that stimulation, now asking him to voluntarily do that, he's engaging his frontal cortex in several ways from a movement perspective and a cognitive perspective, but then boom, he does that and we get a big smile out of him as well. I wanna show this one back to the, um, this is really, let me go to this one first because it's very simple. Talked about um, interosseae, you know, the muscles that are between the bones of the, the hands and the feet. So they help them go in and out. But when we're dealing with the feet, they help us bear weight. They help us transfer weight when we're stepping. Interosseae are very important muscles that are, are even in, in kind of typical humans, are not used much because we're in tight shoes and we don't use our muscles well in the feet. But these individuals, they're not bearing weight, so they can't, uh, they can't activate those muscles anymore. This little guy, sweetest little kid in the world, is one of our, um, one of our Canadian patients. We have a lot of folks come down from Canada, uh, you know, for, I won't get into the <clears throat> healthcare issues, but there's, there's a lot to be uh, desired with uh, healthcare for traumatic brain injury in Canada. So if you look at this, this is really important. He's on, you heard that noise, you'll hear it again in a moment. He's on a vibration plate, uh, two millimeter uh, vertical displacement. So he's on a vibration plate, which should engage certain muscles when we try to hold him up. So we're basically trying to hold him up. He can't bear weight at all. So uh, this little guy was a uh, unfortunate stroke at birth, strangulate, cord strangulation, meconium aspiration, um, just a heart-wrenching case. But he's seeing profound gains. If you look at this now, his right foot, you see none of those toes are engaged on that vibration plate as we're holding his weight over his feet. The left foot, they're engaging. You can see that pretty clearly, right? So engagement on the left, none on the right. What do I do? I just get in and play around with those interossei muscles with the Resimax a little bit. And watch what happens as soon as I touch the Resimax to these interossei muscles between the toes. Watch those toes clench. See that? They just, they just dug right into the foam. I take it away. So I take it away and they're gonna stay there. So those toes are actually engaging now. You can see color changes in the toes because they're actually pressing down like they should. This boy will never bear weight until he can do something like that. So the cool thing is, this was going back months ago. I just spoke with the family uh, and they use this, they use the Resimax all day, every day with him. I just spoke to the family two weeks ago and he's actually bearing weight for, they clearly have to you know, be on the sides, but about 15 seconds at a time now under his own power. Uh, pretty darn cool. But that right there, I mean, that's all we did. The vibration plate alone was helpful, but not helpful enough. So we just get that Resimax between there, activate those, uh, those muscles that assist in weight bearing. And now he, uh, you know, who knows? Who knows what the future holds, but there is a higher level of humanism and ability to bear weight at this point. So I want to show this one. This one will be just a couple of minutes, but this is important how we couple Resimax with other therapies. Now this is the, um, the fighter I told you about, Matt Hughes. So watch this. So this is just the ad adult version of what we just saw there. So if you look, look at, look at Matt's left foot, no engagement. Look at his right foot. You can see white, white, white. You can see the whites on the feet because he's engaging. So he's pushing blood out of those toes as he's engaging with the ground. He's just standing there zero engagement with that left foot. And as soon as I hit play, you're gonna see the toes are actually just lifting off the ground constantly. And then we go through this whole kind of repertoire of uh, Resimax stimulation, some uh, manual manipulation, and, uh, and then we stand them up again and you'll see right at the end how different, well, at the end, just look how different that left foot looks. Not perfect, but much better. So here we go, look at these toes now. See them, they're just kind of coming off the ground right there. So. Feet. 
So what we're doing, we're just scraping the underside of the foot. As we do that, they get a flexor response. Even if they have pathological reflexes that force their toes up, we can cause a flexor response, which is, you know, somebody who's had that kind of brain injury is really, it's critical for them to be able to engage and walk effectively. He was one of the funniest guys. He, uh, you know, really interesting a lot of what he said. Even when I adjusted him for the first time, he said he never let anybody do anything like that to him before, but uh, he's come a long way. So I'm just gonna fast forward through that a little bit. So we're just getting between all those toes. Then we go ahead. I'm just doing some joint manipulation, long axis traction, just pulling on his toes. You can hear the pops actually. And some, you know, up the whole chain, adjust the knee, the hip, everything else. And then watch here at the end when he stands. So you see that engagement now of that left foot. There's actually some, the toes are, are digging into the ground a tiny bit, but at least they're not coming up. So his anti-gravity systems are working more effectively at this point. It takes a good brain to stay on two feet. We should not be able to do that. Uh, it takes a really good brain to stay on two feet. So the more we can engage those systems, uh, it's not just good for him walking and, and moving better, it's also good for this cognitive output, impulse control, self-regulation, all the things we talked about. How am I doing, Cherk? Three minutes. Three minutes, all right. Let me look at another video here. So this is how we use, this is the, um, the fellow that's in from France this week. He's actually spending close to a month with us. Um, a little sad I couldn't be there for him this week, uh, but my associate is there doing some great work with him. So uh, here's what we do. This is a, um, this was, uh, you know, another tragic case, you know, just an instant thing, ADEM, if anybody's heard of that, acute uh, disseminated encephalomyelitis. So it's basically just an attack. The brain has an inflammatory attack for various reasons, kind of like a meningitis in ways, but this specifically attacks white matter. Anything myelinated just gets eaten up and it's not good. Uh, so this fellow this, had this two years ago and um, you know, the good thing is he can walk. He can do a lot that he wasn't able to do. But um, this is how we facilitate some movements with the Resimax. We've got one strapped to the back side of his arm, one strapped to the front side of his leg, and placement is key. Most people in these cases have flexor dominance, so we're typically working or putting the Resimax on the extensor muscles just to drive those systems. A concept called reciprocal inhibition. So if I go to, you know, uh, contract my biceps, my triceps has to shut off. It's a spinal cord reflex. So they both can't be active at the same time or my arm wouldn't move. So in these people where they have this spastic contracture, uh, this, this uh, incessant spasticity, he actually had his left Achilles uh, tendon cut and lengthened because of the severe flexor posture. But we're, we're stimulating the extensors for a reason and then we can go ahead and do things like complex motor skills. Uh, so here we've got laser on his head. We're doing transcranial laser in the part of the brain that actually where the feet live from a movement perspective. That noise that you hear is a metronome. So he's got a metronome beat that we're actually moving the limbs to. So now we're syncing up auditory input. Uh, we're stimulating the nervous system with, uh, and metabolically with laser therapy. And then we're doing the complex motor skills at the same time. And as we do these things, we see more activation. He actually has some, uh, some light, spontaneous activation of his upper extremity right now. We still have to do it manually because we need the whole limb to move, but we're getting there. We're getting there. And I will just show this one. This is a real quick one. This little guy, um, amazing, amazing, amazing. Oh, this is, let me go ahead, do something here real quick. All right. This is the one I wanted to show. So this little guy, uh, I won't really get into too much with primitive reflexes. Dr. Kyle Daigle will be in tomorrow and he'll talk about that. I'm sure uh, Dr. Levine will be talking about some of that as well. Uh, but what happens is this boy, uh, shaken infant syndrome, uh, really just another horrible case, but he had massive brain injury, brain stem injuries, et cetera. Uh, he's about 10 years old. And what happens is uh, he's still peg fed. So he's still fed you know, through, the, uh, through the gut. And what happens, you have, you know, kind of disuse of all this stuff now from the mouth to the stomach. You know, it's just not being used anymore because you're not swallowing. So there's a disconnect. And what happens with the Resimax here, watch this boy's lips. And watch what happens when we get that Resimax on there. You're going to start seeing like he wants to, to be chewing, okay? 
And this is really important. You see what's happening there. So we're getting some impact of swallowing with this. If there's any chance, if there's ever any chance of him actually getting on foods at some point, he needs to be able to do that. So we'll actually do that in concert with putting little pieces of, uh, you know, uh, mashed up food on the tongue so the brain is getting a signal that there's something there it needs to be dealt with and just connecting, reconnecting this to this because it's been disconnected for so long. And the cool thing is, watch this, he never moved stimulus away from his mouth, ever. And watch what happens at the end of the video here. So there's so much stimulation going on right now in his brain. Watch what he does here. His arm is trying to move, trying to move, trying to move. And watch what happens here at the end. This was the best day for me ever because he does this right here. Boom. He, he just told me, get that thing out of my face. And, uh, you know, and that was fantastic because he had never done that before. He just couldn't, couldn't make those actions happen. So, uh, and that was Resimax. To the, that was all Resimax right there. So I can't say enough about this. Um, I really, uh, it's just a phenomenal tool. I think you know how much I love it. So any questions? What do we, what do we got? Do I have time for questions? We have a few minutes. Go ahead. Okay. I'll put up to uh, some resources here. If you ever want to learn more about what we do, um, we've got a lot of information out there, very active on social media. Just, um, you know, you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, wherever else. Uh, but there's a website to YouTube channel building. Yes. With all your techniques or treatments, do you always start at a low level and then work your way up? Do we always start at low level and work up with uh, techniques? For the most part, yes. Uh, because it's, you know, yes, frequency and intensity of stimulation is, is the single most, uh, the, are the single most important factors when it comes to neuroplasticity, for better or for worse. Uh, you know, there are a lot of these folks that we see have been, and, and it's not saying with the best of intentions, people are doing good things, but they often go into too high a level of rehab at first. So we have to go in and build foundations with these people, and it often starts with doing things at a much lower level, much more basic, much lower level, but doing things over and over and over, kind of like a house. You know, you can build a house on the ground, and it's going to look good, but after a while, it's going to crumble. We have to build that neurological foundation, and we always meet the individual where they're at, you know, whatever level of stimulation is appropriate for them, and we can measure autonomic signs, blood pressure, heart rate, respiration, um, you know, sweating, skin temperature, you know, all the biofeedback things. There's lots of things we can measure, but that, that's really important because um, neurological fatigue is not good for somebody who has an injured brain. Yeah. Yes. So uh, putting the Resimax on the boy's foot while he's on the vibe plate, um, you know, her question is, is it, uh, is it the resonance there that's causing that reaction? And, you know, frankly, that's just above my pay grade uh, at this point because there's so many things I could surmise about that. But the fact is we, you know, we do something, we observe it, then we, you know, we shift gears if it doesn't provide the desired result. And what worked for that boy might not work for the next one. So we just have to observe, but I, absolutely, I mean, I, I, for the, the little study I've done with resonant frequencies, there's a lot of power in resonant frequencies. So clearly he had two frequencies acting on that foot and it very well could be that. Yeah. The other question I have too is, you said you use the typical inhibition, so have you ever tried to see if it's like taking the good side to see if you use the amount of power on the good side? Yes, yes, and I had a couple of really good videos that, with that, but I don't want to usurp. Uh, Dr. Levine's time. I can show you after. I had some really cool videos because yes, we will. So we can we can uh, you know stimulate the flexors on one side to inhibit inhibit the flexors on the other side. We do that all the time. I had a great video with um, John Grant. People may have heard about. Uh, there's a team. Dr. Uh, Kyle Daigle coming in tomorrow. Uh, was working with him initially, and we we joined that team. And uh, we were doing quite a bit of that with him. It was a severe car accident, diffuse axonal injury, and we started uh, getting much greater uh, you know. Kind of loosening of that limb, and you know, especially when they're not on the antispasmodics anymore, the baclofen, things like that. So uh, reciprocal inhibition, we will we'll even use lower extremity recipro reciprocal inhibition to impact the upper extremity. So there's you know there's lots of ways in. Yeah, yeah. Any more? We're good. Can we get one from chat? One on chat. Yeah. Uh, is there a way to use the Resimax for the vestibular system post? Is there any way to use Resimax for vestibular system post-concussion? You know, as far as direct stimulation of the vestibular system, uh, 
You know, not necessarily. We can do it with certain head rotation and, and eye movement exercises. Um, but we, you know, it's, it's a full kind of plan. We have to, you know, when it comes to vestibular rehab, we have to do a lot with the connections between eyes, uh, inner ear mechanisms, postural muscles. So we can use it on cervical muscles while we're, do while we're doing certain eye movement exercises to promote greater plasticity in those regions, uh, absolutely. Uh, so it's, it's, there's a lot to that question, but yes, we can. Yeah. I did want to show you, do, do I have 30 seconds, Sherrick? Yeah. All right. So here is Okay, I don't have that one. I, I will have it on my computer later if you want to look at some of those videos, but I think we're good. We're wrapping up.